Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Chem 161. Oh, I just noticed, hold on, that my announcement should say... Oops, that's not the right one. Where's the actual announcement? There it is. Welcome back to Chem 161. Since we're out of the first week, now you're presumably returning. Uh, so as I was mentioning in the chat, just in case you're just arriving and scroll, uh, it is scrolled off the screen or you're not reading the chat or whatever. Um, so today, YouTube is partially down across the world, I just discovered. Uh, I am unable to change my logged in account, which is important because I have my teaching account, which is where all these videos go. And then I have my personal account, which is where I watch like all of my like no rules barred or streaming friends so that it just doesn't accumulate a history on my teaching account and people are like why are you logged into youtube and watching british people play board games wes i'm like because i like british people playing board games <laughs> get off my back it or whatever um i wasn't able to switch between those today and it turns out that that is a known issue thankfully um, but the issue that I ran into was in the first period, I couldn't actually get to the button that I pushed to get to a screen where I can actually send the stream to go live. Um, so I wasn't going to be able to start the lecture. Um, I found a workaround. I logged in and out of my email, and that seemed to do what it needed to, I guess, to get me to where I needed to go uh, so I could stream. But the point is that if there is a technical issue, and 95% of the time, it's on my end. Like, it's it's the software that I'm using isn't cooperating. Um, but occasionally, it does happen that YouTube is down. Uh, I will message in Discord first and foremost. So if you are not in the class Discord, please join that for those updates. If you are ever sitting in uh, the channel just waiting like, hmm, the stream is supposed to be up, but it's not, what's going on? 99% of the time, it's I have a technical issue. Um, I don't use uh, Canvas to send out an announcement because it's extremely tedious um, for me to post an announcement on a short notice. So, like, for instance, if I was going to post technical difficulties on Canvas, I have to create the announcement. I have to set it for the future. So, like, some number of minutes in the future that my clock is not going to tick through. Hit post move that announcement to the class pages so it has to update that there too and then when the time ticks by that i've set it to it will then send out the announcement if i have five minutes to do all of that odds are that you won't get that announcement until when class should start and i probably won't have realized there's an issue at that point so discord i can literally just type a message and instantly everybody knows so it is far faster for me to use discord to do that the only time i will send an announcement on canvas is if i have to cancel the lecture for any reason if you don't get a, an announcement from lecture from Canvas or Discord and the lecture doesn't go online, odds are that I have had either catastrophic hard drive failure on my end and I can't access anything or I have died. Uh, in either of those cases, um, that would be very, very bad. <laughs> We're going to hope that that doesn't happen. <laughs> Ide ideally, I will be able to notify you that something is wrong. Um, there has been one instance where I was not able to actually access Canvas, uh, and that was because one of my monitors died last quarter. And when I hit Chrome, it would pop up on the dead monitor, and I couldn't actually get to a Chrome window where I could type an announcement. So so that would be catastrophic uh, failure of, of, of hardware or something like that. Uh, so that does happen. It's very unlikely that I will die. <laughs> so please don't worry about me in that regard. But you know, you gotta you gotta account for everything. What are we doing today? We are going to keep working on chapter one. I'm gonna try and whip through sig figs and stuff like that because you've taken 140. You understand what sig figs are. So let's do that. That's the focus of today is to do sig figs and do all the calculations and stuff uh, so that we have all of that behind us. So. By the very nature of measurements, all measurements are inexact. If you stand on a scale, and the scale reports your weight as this. Oh, my pen vanished. There we go. 184.0 pounds. Actually, let's, let's not end with a zero here. Let's end with some other digit. Is your weight 184.6 pounds exactly? Or do you weigh 
Do 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 do. Do you weigh 184.600000 forever? And the answer to both of those should be, well, no, I'm probably somewhere in between those, right? Your scale is only good to so many digits, and it stops printing them once it doesn't know what the next digits are. So if you stand on the scale and you weigh 184.6, what it's telling you is that, okay, it detected a number between these values, and then it rounded, because that's as good as it can do. It does not imply that it has measured you to exactly zero 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 forever. Any tool that makes a measurement will follow this exact same procedure. It can only give you so much information. And at that point, there just aren't enough lines or reference marks for you to count between. For example, in this graduated cylinder, I know that the volume is between 21 and 22. How much do I know? Well, it's about halfway, right? So something like this would be appropriate. But something like this... would not be, because these digits right here that I'm drawing an X through are essentially random. Can there be a time where a measurement can be exact? There are two instances, and we're going to talk about both of them. So whenever you do a, me a measurement, you're always going to have an estimated digit. And that estimated digit is always the last one. So this is our estimated digit. All the other numbers will be known, but you will have one digit that is approximate. And it could be plus or minus one in either direction based on your senses and your perception. If you're proficient in perception and you get your proficiency bonus, you'll probably have a better chance of writing down the correct number than, say, me, who is visually impaired and wears like 2,400 uh, vision correcting lenses. <laughs> so this is going to be known as uncertainty. All measurements are uncertainty, it, are, have uncertainty if they use a tool. So if I was going to write down the measurement of water in this tool, I would have to estimate the next digit. So I've already done that here. Here are the rules for how to measure anything. I have this written as three rules. Um, previous class I've done it in two, but I just split the first rule into two steps. So here are the rules to measure anything. Anything with marks on it is going to follow this procedure. You are going to first find the two marks that your object falls between. That's these. And I'll write their numbers in there, and then my pen will glitch out because, of course, it will. What I'm going to do is I'm going to then write down all of the digits no that are known for the lesser of the, I don't know what happened there, two marks. So the lesser mark is 21. I'm going to write that down. Those are my known numbers. I know that for sure. And then I'll guess the next one digit. So this is roughly halfway between, maybe a little higher based on where I drew the pen. So I would guess this. And then don't forget your units. So that should be very straightforward. We have all made measurements in Chem 140. We should all know how to use a tool. So what I want you to do is I want you to do the same practice for this. I want you to tell me what you'd measure for ruler A and ruler B. Type your answers in the chat on what you get. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom this in. Here's ruler A. I'm going to leave this on screen for about a minute, and I'm going to move it over to ruler B once we're done. I'm going to hit mute, let you type that in the chat. And we'll check up with you in just a bit.
All right, let's go over the answers here. Let me zoom this. I'll, we'll zoom back on Unruler A. So we're going to use the same rules that we just mentioned. I do need to select the pen tool. Oh, I can't do this while zoomed in. That's right. Photoshop is strange like that. All right. So identify the marks this falls between. So that's four and five. Write down the smaller of the two marks. So that's four. Guess the next digit. I think it's halfway in between. So I'm going to write this. Don't forget your units. Okay. Next one, my marks are much closer together here. So I'm going to write down the first mark. And then I'll guess the next digit. And I'm going to guess like six or something. I don't actually know. That's good enough. So there you go. You'll, oops. My keyboard is double typing. All right. You'll notice that because of the ruler on the right, ruler B, has more marks on it, you can write more digits. The more marks that are present, the more digits you are capable of writing down for certain. And then you'll always have the last digit, which you'll guess, because you can tell approximately where it falls between it. Now, you'll notice that I wrote a different number than what some of you wrote, and also a different number than what my answer key says. The estimated digit is just that. It's an estimate. So if you are off slightly in one direction over the other, you're still okay. However, there is a tolerance that I expect when I am writing out the answer key. And generally speaking, that is plus or minus three in the last digit. I feel like that's a wide enough window so that you won't fall outside of that range due to like things like rounding or like perception. I know not everybody is proficient in perception, and for some of us, wisdom is our dump stat. That's a D&D &D joke. So if you have a minus one to perception at level one, I hear you. I feel you. I've played that character. <laughs> What's going on around you? Hell if I know. What do you do if you have a balance? What are the measurement marks on a balance? Well, the balance automatically does this for you. Here are our numbers that are known on the balance. This last number is our estimate. And the balance works on the same way. If I was going to write this out as a scale, it would be something like this. And our object would fall, like, say, right there. So that I could say, OK, I know these numbers for sure. And then the next digit I'm going to estimate whatever it is. This is why balances fluctuate a lot, because it's trying to constantly estimate that last digit. It knows where it fell between, but it's trying to do its best to say, oh, okay, you're four-tenths of the way between this one and this one. So balances automatically do this process for you. So in the laboratory, which we're not doing this quarter, unfortunately, fall quarter, we're going to get it back into the lab, I believe. All of our classes are on campus, as far as I'm aware. Mine are, at least. Um, you'll be working with a balance, and it operates by the same principle. So. All right. Now, how do we track uncertainty? We measure the amount of uncertainty in something by using the concept of significant figures in two ways. The first is how many digits you write down, and the second is what is the last place in which there is a sig fig. Remember that a significant figure is any digit that you know for sure, so reliably known means you're certain of it, or the first digit that you estimated. So that would be that last digit in all of our measurements. The last digit that you write down as a sig fig will be your estimate. And it's significant because you can narrow down what it is. Because remember, if something was 21.1, you know that the last digit is probably closer to the, the line than, uh, than, say, like 6 would be. So for this number down here, 21.1, .1, so if these are our marks here, 20, or 20, 21, 22, and my object fell right here, I would not write this as my guess. This 8 is too far away. Likewise, I probably wouldn't say 7, 6, 5, 9, or whatever. One or two would be appropriate. So that last digit is estimated, and it does count as a sig fig, because we can narrow it down to some degree of certainty. Now, 
Now, the more digits that you can write down and the more places you get, the better your tool is. So, for instance, that number down there with all of those decimals after it, 21.32575, whatever, that required a much better tool than just a standard ruler because we would have to have marks for every position that whatever this is. This is where our marks would be. So all of these digits would be known, and that last digit would be our estimate. I guess I write that down. So these are all known. All right. Now, zero can cause some issues because of the fundamental nature of how we use zeros to properly represent numbers. And the first case that we're going to come up with is zero as a magnitude adjuster, also known as a placeholder. So for this first example, we're going to talk about why we use zero as a placeholder. Let's suppose I owe you this much money. If I owe you $3,996 and I say, well, I'm going to just round that up to 4000 because whatever. And then I say, well, these zeros aren't significant, so I'm not going to care about them. And I pay you this much. You'd be rather upset, and I don't think I could criticize you for that, right? This is not how numbers work. Just because they're zeros doesn't mean they're meaningless. It just means that they are empty placeholders. We need the zeros so that I can push this number into the thousands place. But I cannot just write the number four and say, oh, that was actually 4,000. I have to actually do this to it, right? So these zeros don't affect the value of the object in terms of what this number is, but they do affect its magnitude. So placeholding zeros are a thing that we need to get our number to represent the order of magnitude that we intend it to. This is a feature of having something that, or a numbering system that is base 10. When you exceed 10, you have to write another digit. We can write 0 through 9 in one digit, but the next number, we have to start over again and then increment another digit. And once we get to 99, then we have to use the hundreds place, and then the thousands place, and so on and so forth. So we, we're we reusing the same numbers, and we have to put these zeros in there in order to give a order of magnitude that we intend. Zeros that are placeholders do not count as significant figures. How do you determine this by looking at a number? The way that I recommend doing this is that if you highlight over your digits and the number's uh, value changes, so 125 is very different from 1.25 million. Those zeros that you covered up must be significant. Those are two different numbers, right? Likewise, if I have a decimal, same deal. These zero, this is a very tiny number. If I get rid of these zeros, though, it now becomes a relatively large number. That's no good. I have to have those zeros so that this number represents what I am measuring. So these zeros are placeholders. I will not count them as sig figs. This should be a review for everybody. So we're going to move on to the next few examples. If you make a measurement and you have zeros trapped inside your known sig fig, so for example, this zero right here, that zero is known. And the reason that it's known is because these are all my known digits, and this is my estimated digit, right? I just happen to land on zero. For instance, let's suppose that I was measuring this number. On a, on a scale. So 19, we'll put another mark in here, 20, 21, 22. And my object was right about here. I would write down the numbers that are known. I know that it's 20 because it fell between 20 and 21. The next digit I would write down would be, my, so these are known. And then the next digit would be my estimate. It is possible for you to land on a zero and have it be known. 
And that will happen if that zero is trapped between two sig figs. So it will count as a sig fig too. Also, if you are in, if you are about my age or older, this song is now stuck in your head. That's Jenny's number for those of us who didn't get there. All right. <laughs> I knew I'd get somebody with that. All right. The last important rule to note for sig figs is the decimal rule. If you have a decimal point, then you must follow the decimal rule. And the decimal rule is the following. First, find the decimal point. Boop, we already did that. Second, Find any sig figs that are non-zero. They are definitely sig figs because they're non-zero, right? So we would indicate them. Once you've done this, anything that is to the right of this is a sig fig. Anything to the left of what you've underlined must be a placeholder. Now, how do I know that these are significant figures? Well, if I scrabble, if I scribble them out, scrabble them out, I don't know what I'm saying there. The value of my number doesn't change, does it? It's still 0 0.003835. So why would I indicate these extra zeros here? I only would indicate them because they are known. What that means is that my object has fallen onto a zero when we measure it. Let's show a picture of that real quick, just so that we're all on the same page. I'm going to pick a different number, though, one that's a little simpler to write. I'm going to say that this is my measurement, and so here's my tool. And then my object landed right here. So... I would use the rules of measurement, indicate which two your object fell between, so it'd be these two, because I'm just slightly on that side. Write down the smaller of the two marks, and then guess the next digit. Well, because it's so close to the line, the next digit I would guess would be zero. So these are known, and then this is estimated. So there are instances where you may need to write a bunch of zeros at the end, and they're all sig figs. And it's if you have a tool where you end up in a situation like this. So if you see a bunch of trailing zeros in a decimal, we wrote those zeros there for the intent reason that they are known, or closely estimated, if it's the last one. So be mindful of that. That is a situation that can occur in the lab, and you don't just drop all your zeros. Because it'd make no sense that I would be like, okay, everything on here is three sig figs until I get to this specific point and then it's only one? That doesn't make any sense, right? Should be three sig figs all the way through because the ruler is good for the same amount of precision regardless of what number you get. All right. Uh, I think I have more examples on the next slide. Yeah, there's some examples there. Ah, sorry, my mouse is freaking out now. So you can pause the video and look at these examples. I just want to get you to the exercises so that you can try them on your own. So here you go. I have five numbers. I'm going to, or four numbers, actually. I'm going to highlight these for you. So these are the numbers that I am intending for you to do for this exercise. So tell me how many sig figs are in each of these highlighted numbers. This dot is part of this number, so I'll highlight it there, too. And then down here for this problem, I want you to tell me what you should measure for each of these graduated cylinders where the water level is. I'm going to erase those marks because that didn't, that wasn't as clear as I thought it was. So tell me what number you'd write down for each of these measurements. I'm going to give you about three or four minutes to do it. Uh, actually, what I should do is I should give these letters so that you can indicate them in the chat. And we'll go over the results in just a second. So see you in a bit.
One more minute, we'll go over the answers. All right. Let's go over the answers here. Uh, I need my pen, which I set over here. So for this first one, 900, this is the only significant figure because it's the only digit. The other two zeros are placeholders. So this is one significant figure. For B down here, these digits are known, 9, 2, and 1, and the 0, which is also trapped between them. But this other 0 at the end is a placeholder, so there are four significant figures written. For the mass of the flea, I've got these two for sure, and there's a decimal in place in place. Everything to the right counts as well. So there are three sig figs. And then for the last one, D here, notice that there is a decimal, so we do have to apply the decimal rule, which means that all of them count. So there are three sig figs for this one as well. Very important to note, this number and this number with a dot are different. This is one sig fig, this is three. You must apply the decimal rule if you see a decimal point. By that notion, if you are describing something to somebody and your description includes measurements, do not end your sentence with a measurement because the period at the end of your sentence could be misconstrued as a decimal point. So you would say this is a 100 with one sig fig milliliter beaker as opposed to the size of this beaker in milliliters is 100, period. That second one would miss would misinform uh, you of the precision of the beaker. So don't end sentences with numbers, just as a general rule. For the cylinders down here, I have two marks. There's actually a mark at zero. So what I would do is I would say, okay, for A, I have 0,000. And then I'd estimate the next digit, which would be a five or so. And then I tidy up that number because we don't write numbers like that. So this should be 500 milliliters. B, same thing. Here are my marks. I'm going to write the first one that I know for sure, 500 something. Then I'll guess the next number. I'm going to guess four or five. It looks a little under. However, I cannot report 54 as my volume. It has the wrong magnitude. So I do need a zero placeholder. For this one, we don't have to worry about placeholder shenanigans. You just write down the 54, and then you can guess the next digit. All right. Any questions on sig figs, let me know. Again, this should be review, which is why we're not spending a whole hour on it. We're spending like 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. Let's do some math. Just like in 140, we introduced the concept of doing math, how you had always done it. And then we introduced the concept of sig figs to that, because let's assume that any number in this class is going to be a measurement, because that assumption will be more or less true. I will tell you if the number is exact, because you've counted it, or if we've just defined it as such. We just said, hey, this is true. But for any other number, assume that the numbers are measurements. As a result of that, your measurements are going to produce inexact results. Which means that if I write a number like this, 352.8, we'll go to the next slide here. The numbers that follow after it are not just zeros. 
But if you do addition like this, your calculator is going to treat them as such, right? In reality, we don't know what these numbers are. These are random. So if I do addition, normally I would treat these blanks as 0. So 0 plus 1 plus 0 would be 1. 8 plus 4 is 12. Carry the 1. 8, 14, 18, 19, and so on, right? But in reality, those zeros aren't known. So what is 1 plus question mark plus question mark? It's not 1. It's question mark, isn't it? In fact, I should do that in a different color. 8 plus 4 plus question mark is not 2. It's question mark. So anytime I have a question mark, those numbers don't get to be kept because they are unknown. I don't know what they are. So the strategy for doing addition is to, to follow the following algorithm. What you're going to do is you are going to do your addition on your calculator like you would. You just punch it all in. But you're also going to have to write down the numbers vertically and fill in any of these blanks. Starting from the right, you're going to look for the first position going right to left that does not have a question mark. All of the digits in that place are significant figures. So I don't get to use this place, and I don't get to use this place, because they have question marks. I would get to use from this place onward. So we're going to circle that place, punch it in the calculator, print out what it tells us, and then round to the place we have circled. All right. So that's addition. I want you to do the following examples just as a proof of concept. So here's the first one. I want you to tell me what the answer is in the chat. Write it out, punch it in the calculator, truncate to the correct place, and then we'll reveal the answer. All right, we all got the correct answer. Very good, 4.1. Let's show how we got that as our answer. All right. If I do the subtraction on my calculator, I get that. I have this blank here, so when I come in from the right, I don't get to use this position, but I do get to use this one. So this is where I'd round my answer to. The reason that we're doing all of the numbers in our calculation is purely for rounding. So if the last digit was like, say, 5 that I had crossed out, it would influence my 1. I'd round it up to a 2. And the reason that we do that is because, remember, that last digit is estimated. So it could be plus or minus in the given direction. But by virtue of me having a 5 in the next position, the odds are more likely that the number is going to be slightly bigger. Again, it's still estimated, so we might be off, but we're just sort of hedging our bets here based on the numbers that we know for sure. All right. I want you to do this example now and type your answer in the chat. Be careful. Read the correct number of sig figs for each value in the sum.
All right, I see 7,400, and that is also correct. Very good. Let's write that one down, too. So I'm just going to write down what my calculator spits out. Should get something like that. And then we'll go in and fill in all the question marks. So question mark, question mark, question mark. So I don't get to use any of these digits. So starting from the right, no, no, no. So these are all just rubbish. But then I get to here. How many significant figures are in the number 7,300? There's only two, right? These are known. These other zeros are placeholders. Therefore, they are essentially also question marks. And so we don't get to use these either. So no, no, yes. So these are no good. These are rubbish. These are rubbish. We round to this position. Now, you can't report your answer as 74 because 7,300 plus something is not 74, right? So we have to then go in and fill in our placeholders. And that's our answer we report. So you guys understand this, the gist of this. We don't need to do this last example, but you can easily tell that if I add something with the ones place, that's going to affect this digit. But the first sig fig I have is over here, so it's not going to affect, affect my answer at all. For those of you that are looking at that last one going, well, that's kind of strange. Why did that happen? I have the lottery analogy to present to you. Why this logically makes sense. So let's suppose that you decide that you don't want to be an engineer or a biologist or whatever anymore. Instead, you're going to invest all your money in the lottery, and lo and behold, you win the Powerball. And you win $656 million to do whatever you want. I'm spreading these zeros out just for spacing. Being a new millionaire, you celebrate in the only way that you know how. You buy a Big Mac for $7.99. How much money do you have left? Do you have $655,999,992.01? Or, more realistically, do you say, I don't give a shit about these digits anymore. Nobody cares about those. I have... $656 million. You don't give a shit about the ones place if you have that much money. This is where I am reminded of that Arrested Development. How much could a banana cost? $10? Like, that amount of money means nothing to you. You could drop $10,000 on a banana and nobody gives a shit. No one's going to blink an eye. Well, I would I would bat an eye because it'd be like, that's an expensive banana. It better be made of solid gold. But it, uh, it does not affect your bottom line. You still have $656 million after rounding, right? So large numbers are not affected by very, very small, precise numbers. So if you have a large degree of precision on a number, like this is a very precise number down here, versus a very rough precision number, you lose all that precision and your result is unaffected. So be mindful of cases where you have very, very strange orders of magnitude differences, because the takeaway for addition is that the addition and subtraction rules care about decimal places. And that's all they care about. They do not care about where your what your sig figs are, how many you have. They care only about the orders of magnitude relative to each of them. All right. Let's do multiplication and division, and then we'll be due for our break. This is a problem that anybody can do. How do you find the area of a rectangle? You multiply the sides together. Okay, let's do that. Now, if I have one number that's very precise and another number that is not as precise, and I do the long multiplication, I'm going to get tons and tons and tons of question marks as I do this calculation out, aren't I? And then at the end when I add them, I would have a bunch of digits that I just don't get to use. 
we're going to simplify this process so that you don't have to do long multiplication because who does that shit anymore, right? That was like third grade, fourth grade. You could do long div- long multiplication and long division. And we were promised we would never have to do this again once we got to algebra, right? Our calculator would do it for us. I am not willing to renege on that promise because it's long multiplication is too it's too long. Instead, we're going to do the following. Here's the algorithm for multiplication. For each entry, count the number of sig figs. Then punch the number in your calculator. So here's my calculator over here. I'm going to punch this in. And I'm going to hit enter. And it's going to spit out a bunch of numbers. And I'll just write them all down for now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to truncate my number down to, not truncate, but round down to, the smaller of the number of sig figs. So of 6 and 2, 2 is smaller. So my answer should have 2 sig figs. What 2 sig figs are those? I'm going to take them from the left. So there's my 2 sig figs. Note that the one after it may affect your result because you have to round there. So I'm rounding to the spot. There's your answer. For what it's worth, because chemistry does not involve multiple trials of stuff, I don't do banker's rounding. So you do not always round to even. You do not have to. Just round however you think is appropriate. Generally speaking, that's traditional rounding, where you five or greater round up, four, four or lower round down. Yes, we will introduce a small amount of bias in our answer towards larger numbers, but because we only have one or two trials in each of our experiments anyway, that error is going to be very, very small. If you were in physics doing hundreds of trials on something, then you would want to do banker's rounding, or round to even. But for this class, I don't give a shit. Round, round normal. And that's fine. If you are just if banker's rounding is ingrained in your head because you had Valerie for 140 or whatever, that's totally fine. Just do it that way. It'll be okay. Remember, the last digit is where your estimate is, so I accept a deviation in that last digit anyway. For these specific problems, I do expect you to get that answer, 92. But later on, we're doing calculations where you're going to be doing like seven or eight calculations in a row before you spit out an answer. If you're off in the last digit, I don't care. It's estimated. It's implied. All right, there's my work for it. All right, I'm going to give you the examples. Tell me the answer. Punch in your calculator. Round it to the correct number of sig figs. All right, we got 6.5. Let's punch this in the calculator first. So 5.4336 times, not 9, 1.2. There we go. So my calculator reported 6.52032. How many sig figs should I keep? Well, this value has five sig figs. This one has two. Of those two, 2 is the smaller number of sig figs, so my answer should keep 2 sig figs. And there you go. Very good. We'll have you do one more. Here's the next one.
All right. Punch that in the calculator. 34.836 divided by 0 0.380. Boop. I get 70 billion digits. But same thing. So five sig figs for this one. Three for this one, because I count this one and that zero. So I'm only going to keep three for my number. So I'm going to round 91.67368 to 91.7. Excuse me. I have the hiccups. All right. This last example you can do on your own, but you should get a one-digit number. So whatever you punch in the calculator, round it to one digit, you should get four. That's obnoxious, but it makes sense because you have a very precise number being manipulated by an imprecise number. So the number that you get as a result is imprecise. Ah. All right. This is because multiplication and division care about sig figs. Note that this is different from addition and subtraction. Don't mix up the rules. All right. If you have any questions, I'm happy to field them during the break, because that's where we're at. I'm going to play more Chrono Cross music. Uh, we're going to we're going to pick a song to start this off that basically haunted me as a child. Every time this would come on, I would just feel like ooh, goosebumps and chills. So here you go. I hope you enjoy it.
There we go. Welcome back. Wind this down here. There we go. All right. On the screen, I have the next slide, uh, which is more or less just a warning about using a calculator. I have a calculator on the screen here, so I'm going to do this operation. Do, 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 plus, do, 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 do. And when I hit enter, you're going to notice that I did it wrong. That's the first thing you're going to notice. You're going to notice that <laughs> when I do the correct operation, that I only have a one-digit number for my answer. But when I do this written out, I should, since I have sig figs going all the way to the thousands place, I should keep all the way to the thousands place. So I would actually report all these numbers. Be very careful when you're using your calculator. Uh, Wolfram Alpha also does this. It truncates out all of the zeros it thinks are unnecessary. Um, many calculation programs do this. Be mindful of this issue because calculators don't know what sig figs are. And it will do them wrong. Make sure that you are applying the addition subtraction rules when you do addition subtraction. And the multiplication division rules when you're doing multiplication division. Most of our operations in this class will be multiplication division. However, there are some cases where you do need to do addition and subtraction. So don't just apply multiplication division to everything. Resist that habit. Make sure you know both rules and apply them in the correct spots. Now, in some instances, you have to do both. What do you do when you have to do both operations? And the answer is we have to follow both the order of operations. I wrote this horizontally, but I wanted to write it vertically. And the rules for sig figs. So we all we all know what this is, right? So P is so we have the little slogan, please excuse my dumb ass sibling. Right? Maybe that's not how you learned it, but whatever. So P is parentheses, E is exponents, M is multiplication, D is division. A is addition, and S is subtraction. And some versions of this have little split lines here to let you know there's a priority. Multiplication and division are the same priority. Addition and subtraction are the same priority. And you do these priorities in this order. So in this problem as written, I have a parenthesis, so I'm going to do everything in the parentheses first. So that's subtraction. So I would need to do this operation first. And so if I punch this in the calculator, 73.8 minus 70.983, this is the result the calculator spits out. Then I have to do my sig figs rules. Well, I can't use this position because there's a, a blank here. And I can't use this position because there's a blank here. So these are rubbish. So the result of this operation right here is 2.8. Now that I've done that, I can then do the division rule because that's the next priority we run into. So now when I punch this in my calculator, 2.8 divided by 2.639, I get 1.06 da 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 whatever. But using the division rules, I should round to this many sig figs. And that's the answer you would report for this problem. Now, if you retain all the digits, but just keep the knowledge of, hey, I should have two sig figs, you're going to get an answer that's fairly close to mine anyway. So I just do each operation one at a time. And if you want to keep extra digits and you want to write something like this, like, okay, these are not digits that I know, but I will keep them for my later calculations, that's fine. But as you start doing like eight or nine of these operations in a row, that gets super tedious. So I personally 
again, because this, we're only doing one or two trials each time, I just chop to the correct number of sig figs, doing the rounding if necessary, and then keep going. Because any number that is reported to you is going to be reported to the correct number of sig figs. And then if you use that number in a calculation, you've lost that information from the preceding steps that somebody else carried out anyway. So I'm just going to assume that these are all steps done by different people. And so this method will get you an answer that's reliable enough. But if you've been taught in the past, like, oh, keep all your digits, but then just make sure you truncate. As long as you do that, you'll get close enough. You'll be within one or two of the last digit. And that's good enough for me. All right. So there's our rules for doing a calculation with multiple operations where you have to change the rules. Every time you change the rules, stop and resolve all your sig figs, get the next value, and then do the next step. Be careful that you don't just do the whole thing and apply the results at the end. Because if you were saying, oh, I ended with the division, I'm going to keep division rules of sig figs. And then you look at this number, and you're like, oh, I should have three. But in reality, you only have two. And the reason for that is because of this step right here where you did a subtraction. So be careful. Don't just look at all the numbers and pick the fewest number of sig figs. I guarantee at least half of the time you'll get the wrong answer because I will do some sort of trick in the problem that will ensure you can't do that. All right, let's give you the examples here. I'm gonna I'm gonna letter these actually A, B, C. What I want you to do is tell me the correct calculation result express to the correct number of sig figs. I'm going to give you five minutes to do these because they should be pretty straightforward. And we'll go over the answers in just a bit. Good luck. We're all counting on you.
All right, one more min <clears throat> excuse me, one more minute and we'll go over the results here. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to put these on this screen. And we don't need this top part. And let's go over these one at a time, just to have this information. So for the first one, I have... You know, I don't actually have to write out the multiplication one. I guess I will anyway, so I've got... All right, so I've got these numbers. This is two sig figs, and this is four. This is the smaller of the two, so my answer when I'm done should have two sig figs. And when I punch this all into the calculator, I get 0. 0.0019 times 21.39. I get 0 0.040641, but I only get to keep two sig figs. So I'm going to, starting from the left, I'm going to take the first two I see. So that's those. And then I got a round. So that should be your answer for the first one. <clears throat> for the second one, same sort of process. There's my fewer, so I should have two sig figs for my answer. We punch that in the calculator, what do I get? That's times. Let's do divided by 4.1. Two point a bunch of numbers. So 2.029. That's probably good enough. I get to keep the first two. And that's the answer I get. For the third problem, we're going to set it up vertically. Do the addition, and I get this. Then I'm going to look for the first position that has a sig fig in all the numbers. Now, I've got a bunch of blanks here, and all these zeros are placeholders, so all of these numbers end up being rubbish. Except for the thousands place, because that's my first sig fig in this top number up here. So the number I would report would be 3, and then I just fill in enough placeholders to get 3,000. Don't add, don't do this. So this is wrong, because this decimal would imply that I know that these are all zero. But I don't know that. This is all I know. It's 3,000 without a decimal. All right. got to reveal more problems here. Let's just put D and E up here for now. All right. For D... If I do this and I type it in my calculator, I get, oops, I hit the pen. I get that as my result. And when I go checking for sig figs, the first position here from the right has a sig fig in all of these, so I get to keep to this spot. And so this number as written is our answer. You'll notice that I lost a sig fig doing the subtraction, and that is normal. 
Because again, addition and subtraction care about decimal places, not sig figs. And then for E, I have two values that both have four sig figs in them each. So my answer should have four sig figs. When I multiply these two together in the calculator, I just get 12, though. So I need to add the extra zeros, and I only add two of them. Note that this is not the same as doing addition. You are not adding 6.00 plus 6.00 because I'm multiplying by 2.000 and not exactly 2. So multiplication can be constructed as addition, but if you're not multiplying by an exact number, it cannot. So again, follow the rules and be careful. All right. For the combined problems here, Oh, I don't know what happened there. My screen flashed. There we go. So for F here, I have in parentheses, that should be a 4, plus 37.3 times, I'll put an X, I guess, 0 0.00390. So I had to do this operation first because it's in parentheses. So let's do that. 48.281 plus 37.3. And my calculator says 41.581. But when I do sig figs, I don't get to keep these, for these digits here because there's nothing in this spot. This is the first digit I keep, so I would round to that spot. So this value here is 41.6. And I can then import that into this calculation. I'll take that number times 0 0.00390. They both have three sig figs. So my answer will have three sig figs. And when I go to the calculator, we'll type that in 41.6.00390. And I get 0 0.16224, where I only get to keep three sig figs. There you go. And then finally for G, same thing, we're going to do the division first. So we're going to do this step first. This top number is six sig figs. This bottom one has two. So my answer should have two. So 52.5000 divided by 3.6. I get 14.58333. I'm going to round that to two sig figs, so that becomes 15. And then I do the subtraction. Next. And there's my answer. All right. Any questions, let me know. Looks like most people got most of them right. I can only see some of the answers because the calculator's in the way. It looks nice on the on the display. You can see the chat and the calculator. I have to stack them on top of each other, unfortunately, so I have to click back and forth here. All right. That's our sig fig primer in review. Let me know if you have any questions about that. In the sciences, it is important that when you are doing any sort of procedure that generates numbers, that you do it multiple times. And the reason for this is because if you trust only one number, the chance of there being error in just that number is fairly high. Because there's always error, right? How do we minimize error? Well, if we take the same measurement multiple times and then take the average we then minimize our error, assuming that the errors come from random sources. So if I have, like here's the correct answer on here, and I get one data point, my answer that I'm going to get is too low compared to the correct answer. But if I take multiple data points, and then I take the average, the average of these seven points here 
would actually be, it looks like it'd fall like right here. And that result is much closer to our target than just any one of these independent points would be. So averaging out error is something you can do to reduce random error. We're going to talk about what random error is in just a second. We're going to look at these dispensers. These are dispensers in an industrial facility that are designed to produce a volume of 10 fluid ounces into a bottle or 296 milliliters because we care about metric units. And so dispenser one, two, and three, we collected some data points from them. And what you'll notice is that if this is the target number, this is the correct answer, this is what you should be getting, 296. All of these numbers right here, kind of on the low side, aren't they? They all miss the target. These numbers over here are much closer, but they're not very close together themselves. This dispenser over here seems to be functioning as intended. We're getting very close numbers to the correct answer. So dispenser one has a mistake in it. There's something wrong with it. Dispenser two has some sort of issue with it as well, but the two issues are independent of each other. Dispenser one does not have anything that differs by more than like a milliliter. So like this is the lowest number and this is the highest number and their difference is relatively close. So they're only, 0 0.8 off. Whereas if I look at the two farthest away here, I have a 298 and a 293. And these are off by oh, almost 4 milliliters. That's, uh, that's pretty significant compared to the other dispensers. So we're going to try and categorize our error in these ways. In this first data set, our numbers are all relatively close to each other. There's very little deviation between the points themselves. And so we're going to call that precise. Something is precise if there is very little deviation between each of your data points. That doesn't mean it's right. That just means that the points themselves have little random error between them. Now. What do we do when we compare against the correct answer? If you take the average of everything, and we can do that for number two here. So let's take the average real quick. So that'd be 298, oops, 298.3, 294.2, 296. I, I hit the wrong button. I have butterfingers today. So I've got all five in there, and I'm going to divide by the number of data points. And you can see that the average of those is real close to the target number, isn't it? So if you take your average, and you end up on the target number, what we call that is accurate. Your data is close to the target value, or at the very least, the average of it is. Because at the end of the day, that's what we care about, right? On average, this is dispensing the correct amount of material. So let's compare all three of these and see what's going on. So in data set number one here, we would say data set number one is precise because all the data points are close together, but we would not say it's accurate. Because the average here, it looks like the average is about 284. That's significantly off of the correct answer. By significantly, I mean more than just the, the uh, second to last digit. Remember, the second to last digit is the last known digit. The last digit is our estimated digit. We can be off in the estimated digit. That's fine. But if the known digit is off, that's an issue. That's not accurate. For data set number two, our average was very close. So we would say it's accurate. But all of the numbers are kind of all over the place. And so we would say it's not precise. 
This one over here, data set three, is both accurate and precise. Now, is there a threshold by which you say something is not accurate or not precise? The answer is not really. There's not really an accepted like standard. You kind of just have to look at it and use your intuition and say, oh, okay, yeah, this is pretty far off of the correct answer. On the problems that I give you, there will always be an intended solution. And so if you look at the numbers, you're like, wow, these are pretty far off from the correct answer. Then you would say not accurate. If it appears like there's a lot of deviation in the numbers, so like number two, obviously there's a lot of deviation. You would say not precise. I'm not going to try and trick you and put numbers in like a threshold where it's like, oh, it could go either way. I'm going to give you an obvious answer. And if you look at it and you're like, oh, it's it doesn't seem that obvious, then you're overthinking the question. Go with your gut on it. Because there isn't really a standard that we apply to this. We've already done this, so we'll go to the next slide. All right. What are the types of error that lead to this sort of thing? So over here, there are specific types of error that are occurring. And we need to identify that so we could diagnose it. Why is dispenser 1 off in the direction that it is? Why is dispenser 2 doing what it's doing? Is there any error in dispenser 3? Well, there's not all 296s, so there must be some error, right? Let's describe what those are. On the screen here, I have a graduated cylinder with three possible viewpoints and the amount of volume that can be measured in this burette. The burette counts top to bottom. We'll talk about burettes in a later uh, laboratory. If you are looking at it head on, you will get the number that is intended. So this green arrow is the correct technique. This is correct. If you look too high, then where your water appears to be is right here. And if you look too low, your water appears to be much lower. And you get an extraneously wrong answer. So this is called parallax. And parallax arises if you are not using a tool correctly. You're not looking at it from dead on. In other words, you are using the tool incorrectly. The incorrect use of a tool is known as a systematic error. You are doing the experiment wrong. So to summarize what systematic error is, it's you're doing it wrong. If you do something wrong in the laboratory, like you skip a step or you misuse the tool, you're doing a systematic error. You can correct systematic errors. You just redo the thing you did wrong. Systematic errors can be removed. However, by committing a systematic error, you are moving your average further away from the correct answer. So your accuracy of your data will be affected. However, if you do the same wrong step every time, you're still going to get data points that are close to each other. So if we go back to this over here, we notice that these are all off by the same amount, about 13 milliliters off of the correct answer. So this dispenser has a systematic error. What would that error be? Somebody punched the wrong number into the dispenser. I want you to dispense... Oops, I didn't type 296, I typed 283. Or whatever is used to dispense 296 thinks that 296 is at the wrong spot. And so we need to recalibrate it. Because it's doing the same thing wrong every time, but I can correct it, it is a systematic error. And it generates data that is consistently close to each other. Now, what about this other error in set B here? Why am I getting various numbers like this? This is called random error. Random errors are random, and they come from random sources.
These can be any number of things that are beyond the control of either the instrument or the user. For example, if you are trying to read something that is a liquid, and you take a reading <clears throat> at 1 p.m., and then at 2 p.m. the heater kicks on because it's cold out, and then the temperature of the room goes up by 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Since the density of liquids is affected by temperature, and density uh, typically decreases at higher temperature, things will expand, and you'll get a larger volume at a higher temperature. That's not something you can control if the thermostat is not within your ability to control in the laboratory. Likewise, air pressure may affect like any experiments that you do with gases. Uh, if there's a storm outside or a cold front is moving in or something, and the atmospheric pressure changes, maybe you're doing an experiment and suddenly there's a hurricane, and then the pressure changes rapidly. Like, obviously you shouldn't be doing experiments in a hurricane, but these are all just examples of things that could randomly occur. So if we go back to this slide again, how could I be getting these numbers very randomly? And the answer that I would come up with is that the possibility that the solution that's being put into this is at a different temperature each time, and thus is a different volume, is possible. There could be any number of reasons. Maybe it's clogged somewhat, and then each time we dispense, we clear a little bit of the clog, but then between dispenses, some of the solution that's residual solidifies and then can't be ejected, or something like that. It's random, right? Who knows? Now, what about over here? This one also has random error, but it's much smaller. Dispenser number three is a dispenser that is cleaned out is working at the correct setting, and is dispensing as intended. But even so, there's always going to be some amount of random error. Random error is essentially unavoidable. Depending on the nature of the random error, it can affect your accuracy, but it will always affect your precision. If you take the average, like we saw when I took the average of the data set 2, we got real close to the correct answer you average away the random error, because randomly it will be too big, just as likely it will randomly be too small. It's random. You don't know where the error is going to be. So that's a way to tell your types of error apart. Systematic errors, you're always going to have the same error in the same direction every time, because you're doing it wrong. Random error, you don't know which direction your error is in, because it's random. But if you take the average, it goes away. Here's a visual example of this. If you're at the target range, Down he up here in this corner right here, this is my shadow runner who has never held a pistol. This is probably the party's decker. He's good with a keyboard, not good with a firearm. And so he's, he has no training. He's going to do the best that he can. He gets to roll two dice because he dumped his agility stat. Not going to hit the target. Here's where my average would be. Not very close to the, the, the correct... Uh, result, which would be the bullseye, and all of my points are very far apart. So this would be not accurate and not precise. This one down here is my orc street ganger who has a, like six ranks and pistols and a seven agility. He spent his entire life training to do this. He can do this blindfolded with one hand tied behind his back. He gets to roll 13 dice as opposed to two. As a result, he hits the target nearly every time, with very little deviation. So this would be accuracy and precision demonstrated. This example over here is represents an expert, but there is a fault with their firearm. In particular, their sight isn't calibrated correctly. They think they're aiming for the target, but they've sighted it in such a way that when they pull the trigger, all of their results are off by the same amount. So this would be a systematic error. Systematic errors affect your accuracy, but you can still demonstrate skill by doing the same error every time. This last one up here would be similar to B, to uh, Dispenser B, where on average it's doing pretty good. Like, here's where our average would be, somewhere right there. 
However, there's deviation in random directions. So this would be accurate on average because the average result is very close to the bullseye. But for one reason or another, the result is not precise. My best explanation for this would be that there's like very, very uh, high winds at the firing range this day. Or the person who has um, who has stepped up to uh, fire at the target has drank a lot of coffee <laughs> or something like that, and it randomly affects the result. We've already talked about this. Random errors can be removed by averaging, but systematic errors cannot. So when you're looking at your data and you're asked, what could a possible source of error be? Look and see what types of error are present. Random errors are always present but may not be the primary culprit. Generally speaking, I will ask you, tell me what the primary cause of error is, and you should be able to discern between systematic or random, based on either a visual example like this one, or a numerical one like that. All right. Uh, I have nine more minutes, so let's see here. Oh, that's probably going to be the end of the section, so okay. Finally, in the lab, make sure that you're just as precise and as accurate as possible. Read the directions carefully and do multiple trials. We're going to instruct you to do multiple trials on the paper experiments that we have you to do. Um, I have collected all of the numbers for you, but next quarter, summer or fall, or whenever you get into the laboratory and you actually have glassware in there, remember the lecture on precision and accuracy and make sure that you're just doing as much as you can to one Follow the directions so you eliminate systematic error. And two, do as many trials as is possible, reasonably possible, to reduce random error. All right. We're not going to finish Chapter 1 today, unfortunately. We're going to finish it next time. The last section is basically, let's do all sorts of calculations and conversions. And you've been doing this forever. So you know all about writing relationships using unit conversions and how to do those dimensional analysis problems like that. So I don't really need to spend much time doing this because we've been doing dimensional analysis for the entirety of 140. So I'm going to go straight to the examples. I'm going to have you try them. I want you to tell me how many grams does a 6.8 kilogram bowling ball weigh? I'm just going to start you right off with an example. Tell me the answer, and we'll go over the result in about two minutes. All right, how did we get to this answer? Not by having this nothing on the screen. Hold on, where is it? There it is. All right, we'll clear all this out of the way. And we'll switch colors back to black here. All right, so if I have something that is 6.8 kilograms... And I know that I have a conversion. That looks like this. I can do dimensional analysis to remove 
the unit that I don't want by canceling it out, setting them up in this fashion, and then putting the unit that I do want on the other side of the division bar. Because when I do the problem now, whatever result I get will be in grams. And now I just have to append the numbers. One kilogram, a thousand grams. There you go. Easy enough, and everybody got it right. Just make sure you include your units. And similarly, you can do all of these other problems like this. So to convert that to milligrams, you take your result with grams and turn it into milligrams. That's trivial. We're not going to spend time on that. I think everybody can do it. In your textbook online, there is a table that has other unit conversions. So what I want you to do is look up the conversion for this to solve this problem. This is my orc that I used to play in World of Warcraft when I first wrote this slide. He was a shaman, so I figured this figurine, which I have on a in the display case in the living room, um, represents him. He weighs 150 kilograms. I want you to tell me his mass in pounds, or his weight, I guess I should say. Now, you do need to look up a conversion to do this. I'm going to leave it up to you to do that. You can go to your textbook and find Table 1.6, or, you know, it's an online class. Use Google, right? So do this calculation. We'll go over the answer in two, se uh, two minutes, not two seconds. And then we'll call it a day because we'll be out of time. All right, let me, I we don't really need the whole orc on there. That's fine. So let's do this problem. So I found on Google, wrong side of the pen. There we go. I found on Google the conversion. I can't see it because I have a window in front of it. One kilogram equals 2.20462 pounds. I don't need that many sig figs, so I'm just going to write the first four. But if I have a mass of 150 kilograms, we'll set up the unit so that the kilograms cancel out, leaving what we want, which is pounds. And then I'll just import the numbers. One kilogram. And I'm just going to write the first four, because that's fine. 2.204. Oh, I guess it'd be 2.205, huh? Pounds. We can punch that in the calculator. 150 times 2.205. And I get 330.75 pounds. How many sig figs do I get to keep? Well, this one has two. This conversion I wrote down has four. You could have six if you wanted to use all six. But the point is that our answer is only going to have two. And again, don't include a decimal. Be careful. All right. So very basic dimensional analysis. When we come back on Thursday, we're going to do more of these types of problems in more detail. So I'm going to leave these examples for you to try. These are very basic. We're going to start. I'm going to sk skip over them for now, but we're going to start with the more complex problems when we return on Thursday. And then we'll finish chapter one. So we're going to finish chapter one uh, early in Thursday's lecture. Uh, I gotta hit this button now because we're all done. So that's it for me. Thanks for coming to the lecture. I appreciate every one of you. Make sure that you are doing these practice exercises. When we finish chapter one on Thursday, I will then talk about the lab assignment and then we'll move on to chapter two, which does have some new stuff in it. So look forward to that. That's all I got. Have a wonderful rest of your day. 
Make sure you do those practice exercises. We'll see you on Thursday. Take care.